Well, good morning and welcome to Quest Church. My name is Sarah McDonald. I'm the executive pastor here at Quest, and I am so glad that you are here with us today. Now, I will also say 1030 that I'm, I'm very thankful for you guys, because when I got up at the 9 o'clock, somebody in this section went, oh boy. <laughs> and I was like, actually, that is a great reaction to what we're going to talk about here today. And so, because we have been in this series called The Lies That We Believe, and I don't know about you, but I feel like every single week, it has been something, and I'm like, Lord, can I show up on a Sunday and it not be directed at me, please? It has not yet happened. Um, so I know that if I'm feeling that way, I know a lot of you guys have been feeling that way and we've been hearing your feedback with it because we've been talking about the lies, mainly that Christians still believe. That yes, we've said yes to Jesus, but like we still struggle with some things of this world. And so I don't know where you fall in this category. I don't know if you consider yourself a Christian, if you've been following Jesus your whole life, or maybe even this last week, or maybe you're like, I would not put myself in any of those. I am just here, somebody invited me. I'm trying to be respectful, I'm here. But I want you to know this, that no matter where you fall on that spectrum, I'm so glad that you are here today because today we're gonna talk about a different kind of lie. A lie that when I put it up on the screen, I need you to stay with me. Because you're gonna be like, where is she gonna go with this today? Because the lie that I want to look at today is actually a lie that people outside of this building believe. And so you're going to first go, but I'm in here. Don't, don't worry, we'll get to that. It's a lie that I believe is stopping people from coming in to church. It is a lie that's also stopping people from coming to God. And so I think that it is very important that we tackle this lie today. And I also know this. I know this has been on a lot of your hearts because when John Kenny, our senior pastor, kind of reached out to a social media poll, if you will, this came back multiple times. And so I think it's worth addressing. And so the lie is this, the church will burn down if I show up. <laughs> I did tell God that I needed there not to be a fire today, like of all days, I'm like, this is not the day for that. Now, we laugh about it because we've actually heard somebody say this to us, a lot of us. Maybe it was even this week where you were like, hey, like I've been going to this place called Quest, like you should come check it out. Or maybe you've been trying to share Jesus with somebody, and they were like, ha ha, no, I can't go there. And you probably said, why? And they were like, I mean, the place would burn down if I showed up. And we laugh about it, and usually we don't go any further with it because we don't know how to respond to somebody besides, no, it won't. I show up. It didn't burn down when I showed up. Like, you can, you can still come. But I believe that this is so worth looking at because I also know that there are people in this room, even right now, that you might be thinking, well, it hasn't burned down yet. And so you're like, you just keep coming back. You're kind of like testing it. And so I want us to look at today of why I think that people are still believing this and why we as believers, as those of us that are in this place right now, need to care about this. Because think about it. This morning, there are people in this area right now who woke up and knew that it is a Sunday in the South and that they should go to church. But the reason they're not going is because they have believed that something really bad would happen if they walked through these doors. Friends, that should, that should burden us. That should really make our hearts sad that people feel this way. But this is the reality, not only in this community, but across the world. And so why do they believe this? I believe first and foremost is their relationship with God. It's how they view God with this. They believe that they are just not good enough to be able to walk in here. They just don't have it all together. They just haven't figured out, they haven't cleaned up just right to get in here. And friends, if that were the case, none of us should be here right now. We all do not have it together to be able to walk through here, but for some reason, they think that whatever has happened in their past, whatever they even did last night, is so bad that when they step foot on holy ground in a church that God's gonna immediately burn the whole place down. Or even worse than that, they believe that they themselves would burst into flames because when like evil meets holy, that all of a sudden there's a fire that happens. There is a fire that happens, but it's not quite like that. It's an amazing fire of the Holy Spirit that happens, not of things bursting into flames. 
But friends, this morning, there was somebody contemplating coming to church, but figured they just weren't good enough to walk through these doors. And I want to also address this if this you. Maybe you've moved past the place if it's going to burn down, but you showed up a few times, but you feel like you can't even say yes to Jesus or even take a next step or ask questions or anything like that because you're like, I just don't have it together. I want you to say, I want to know this, you're in the right place. Because there is nothing, I want you to hear this, especially if you're listening online, because maybe that's you online, that you're like, I will listen to this, but I am scared to death to come in to this place. I want you to know this, that there is nothing you have done that would stop God from wanting a relationship with you. Nothing. There is nothing that would stop God from wanting you to walk into his house and meet him. That's the crazy part, you ready? This is not our house. This is God's house. Yes, Quest has a name out there, that's not, this is his house, and do you know what he says? Every single time you walk in, he says, welcome home. It could be years you've not been with him. It could be years you have walked away, you have done the unthinkable, whatever that is in your mind. I can tell you this, when you walk back through here, God is sitting there with open arms saying, welcome home. And friends, that's what I hope that each and every person feels when they come into this place, but for so many, they struggle to believe. And I wanna start with this story in scripture to kind of drive home the point of this, of how much God loves you and what he would do for you. And actually, we have shared this story a couple of times in this series, but I want to read it to you from Matthew's perspective. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll find very similar stories about when they were experiencing time with Jesus and they were all at the same place, but they tell it a little bit differently. So Matthew's gospel shares this, and it's Jesus talking. says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hill, so they're safe, up on the hill, and go out and search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than the other 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, is it not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish? Church, I don't know if you picked up on this, but it says that he will rejoice over it more than the 99 that didn't wander away. That is his heart. So friends, if you, want, if you have wandered away, I want you to know this, that he gets more excited that you have come back to him than he does from all of us that have been chilling with him for years and years and years and have been coming to church and doing all the right things. He's excited about you, that you came back. Now, the rest of y'all are like, what about me? Some of you just heard, Sarah said, I don't have to come to church every Sunday. I did not say that. I don't know if you picked up on the story. The other sheep, the other 99, they were secure. They were safe. They already had the shepherd. But he knew that there was one that was lost, and so he wanted to go and find him. And friends, that's who God is, that he cares so much about you that he would go and find you. But what has happened too many times in the church is that we get hung up on that God keeps going after the one when we forgot that we were originally the one. We loved that day. We're like, yeah, God, come on. Thank you for finding me. Do you remember that day when he rescued you and he saved you? You were like, this is amazing. This is awesome. You now have Jesus. Guess what? Other people need him too. And this is the part where we tend, some of us, as Christians, to get hung up on. But I want you to know this, that when someone comes to Jesus for the first time or wanders back, y'all, it is worth celebrating. And as a reminder, this place... Y'all, this place just isn't for the people that have it all together. This place isn't for just the people that have said yes to Jesus. This place is for all of us to get to know God and his heart, and his heart is for the hurting and the lost, and his heart is that all of us would say yes to him and to be more like him. But it can't be just for us that have already said yes to him. And so I want to share another story that's in scripture, that's gonna really get to the heart of things. It's gonna get to the heart of us that struggle with this lie, that struggle to believe that walking in here could really be catastrophic. 
and for those of us that are already in the room today. And so we're going to go to Luke 15, and I want you to know this is the part we're going to pick up in the story. Jesus has already told the story of the 99 and the one, and then he tells another story about a woman that loses her coins, she loses one coin, and she tears her whole entire house apart for this one coin, uses all of her resources, all of it for one. And then he tells this story. And I love it because it starts off like this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them the story. Basically, they did not get it. So he's like, let me try and tell it another way. And this story's a little bit longer. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Y'all, my dad was at the first service. And I did a thing, I was like, Dad, well, how about, what would you feel if I was just like, hey, we ain't waiting until you die, I need it all now. Even as I said it, I was like, that is so disrespectful. We don't even have to fully even understand culture at this time to go, you would not ask for that. It lets us know where the son is. He is so desperate in this moment that he's willing to completely disrespect his father and ask for something that's not even his to begin with. And so his father agrees to divide his wealth between his sons. So a few days later, this younger son packed up all of his belongings, moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all of his money in wild living. You can use your imagination. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man looked so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him but no one gave him anything. Y'all, most of y'all know that I have a little farm with lots of animals and we have pigs. I, I cannot imagine even thinking about eating the things that we give to the pigs, they eat anything. So he's sitting there in his lowest of low, dreaming about eating what the pigs eat and still nobody, nobody gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, good, he said to himself, self, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and I'm here dying of hunger. Basically, what am I doing? I will go home into my father, and I will say, and he rehearses this speech. Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. And I believe that even as he's walking back home, he's rehearsing this over and over and over again. And so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming because he was waiting. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And in that moment, he was also protecting him. And his son said to me, here's the speech, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. And the father doesn't even address him. Instead, he calls to his servants, quick, Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and the sandals for his feet and kill that calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Friends, I want to remind you that this this is for those of us that are struggling about, can I come back to God? Can he really be the God of grace and love and compassion? This story reminds us that it doesn't matter what you have done, what your past is like, the Father is waiting on you. You're like, but Sarah, you don't know my past. It doesn't matter, he's waiting on you. But Sarah, you don't know what I did when I was still in church and church people know. He knows, and he's waiting for you to come home, and he will embrace you and love you, and then he's gonna have a party. Friends, I don't know if you picked up on this, but the house didn't burn when he stepped foot on it. Instead, there was a party. Quest Church, there should be a party in here every time somebody comes back home. Every time somebody comes back to the Father, every time somebody comes for the very first time, because I know some of you are like, well, how will I know? You know when that person comes back. I know you know. We should be a partying church. 
In fact, Dr. Kruger, who wrote the parable of the dancing God, which literally rocked my whole entire world about this scripture, he says this, is this not the very heart of evangelism? So sharing the good news, is this not the very heart of that? That when people hear the music and dancing in the church that they want to know what it's all about. Is it not the very heart of our mission? Are we not called to be a celebrating people who are so excited and filled with grace and joy of our Father that the celebration gets the attention of the world? Friends, do we have the attention of the world? I would say some churches do, but not for this. Not for being a celebrating people full of grace and joy of our Father. If every church was like this, friends, think about it. You would want to come in. You wouldn't be questioning, can I? You'd be like, when are they having church? I want to show up. I want to experience that. But here's what I believe. I do believe that people struggle with this lie, and they believe it because of how they see God, because they're struggling to know, could God actually love me? Could he really accept me? Could he really be standing there with open arms? But I believe this. I believe a lot of the reason why people still believe this lie, who are still out there, is because of how we as the church are portraying Jesus to them. Because I don't really think we're a celebrating people filled with that grace and joy of our Father. Instead, we're judgy, we're resentful, we consider a lot of times ourselves better than others. Think about y'all, even this week, I was like, Lord, why do people believe this? Who is telling them this? Like, who, like, who is treating them like this? Who is you? I wanted to like place blame and all this, and the Lord was very clear. He was like, you. I was like, Lord, I've been doing good. I've been loving people. I've been loving that person, that person. I did that well. And he was like, yeah, but how are we doing all the time with every body? And here's how I know that we still struggle with this. Because of how we respond when people come back. Think about this, especially if you've been in church for a while. You see somebody come back and you might say under your breath, oh, we'll see how long this lasts. Or, I just give it a couple weeks, she'll be with somebody new, she won't be here again. Or you might say, oh, I'm glad he's sober now, but I give it six months, he'll be back in jail. This is how we tend to respond. And I don't believe we have the heart of malice that we're like against the person. It's like what we see when somebody comes back in. And instead of going, of throwing a party and being excited, they're back, we're like, yeah, we'll see if it works out this time. Yo, what if... I was thinking, what if you said that about me when I walked back in? I'm like, that, that would hurt, right? But it's like, almost like we were trying to protect our hearts because maybe that person's hurt us or something else. Like we can come up with reason and excuses after, but we are to be a partying church. We should rejoice that that person's come back, not be jaded or callous, though we should throw a party. Now going back to the scripture story, yo, I wish... Oh, y'all, I wish that the story stopped here. Like, they threw him a party, everything was good, move on with life. Jesus knew we were going to need the rest of this story. Some of us needed the first part to be able to talk about how we need to come home, but there's some other people in the story that I think that if you've been a Christian for a while, that you will relate to in this. And so the story continues on this way. But meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, He was doing what he was supposed to do. When he returned home, he heard that music and the dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what is going on? They said, your brother is back, he was told, and your your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. (laughs) The older brother was angry. He didn't get excited he had come back in. He didn't get excited that who this, you know, his brother, literally they thought he was done out there, left for dead, was back. No, he was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him to come inside. But instead, the brother, the brother said, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. I've done everything right. And in all that time, you never even 
gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours, don't you know that? It's kind of like when you're like, your son. <laughs> when this son of yours, not my brother, but your son comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Y'all, the older son pitches a fit. And I have to tell you, full disclosure, that I relate a lot to this son. That in certain moments, I start going, but God, I have done like everything right. Y'all, some of you know me, I am a rules person. Like you tell me the rule, I'm gonna follow it to the T, like that is how it is. So like I, I can get caught up so many times in the rules of Jesus. Like, let me check it off. I have done all the right things. And y'all, I'm even married to a state trooper, which means I like have to follow the rules. It's like a double whammy. But with this, so many times, we as Christians can start going, when we watch, and this is what has happened to me, when I've watched somebody who has had a really hard life, has made really bad choices after choices after choices, and then they find Jesus, I find myself not being able to celebrate because I go, why me? Why not me? Why are we focusing on that? She's really done really horrible things, and now she finds Jesus, Woohoo! What about me? And this is where I want to caution us as a church is that sometimes when we've been following Jesus for a while, we can fall into this trap. And what it tells the world is, you're still not good enough. Just because somebody hasn't been following Jesus as long as you have, now here is this. It's not a competition on how long you've been following Jesus and how long I've been following Jesus. Because somebody could have met Jesus and started following him last week and they look more like the father than I do who's been following Jesus for most of my life. Because our entire goal of following Jesus is to look more like him. And there's not a timetable on that. With how many years is the discipline that we put into that. But friends, too many times we make it all about a competition. If you notice this brother, it was a competition and he was like, father, I've been here, where's my party? And the father is heartbroken because he's like, you, what, your son, like your, your older brother, your younger brother is home. Why, why are you missing this? Why do you not see it? And he says the whole thing, like I've been with you this whole time. Why has there not been a party? Friends, it struck me this week that I went, God, I've been with you for so long. That's the party. I am, I am so grateful that I've known Jesus for so long. Why I keep comparing it to somebody that's coming here, I am grateful for that because of the opportunity that gave me. I'm thankful that my parents raised me in church and then now I'm thankful to be able to see somebody else come to know Jesus. It's not a competition. It's not something to pitch a fit about, but it's something to celebrate. And then the story still goes on. And I love how the father responds here because he doesn't just say, get over yourself, which is what I think I would have told the son. I'd be like, you need to get over yourself. This is not about you. This is about him. We'll talk about this later. Get on your party clothes and let's go have this party. Instead, the father says this. He says to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he is found. Friends, can you imagine the look on the father's face when he realized that the son, the son that's been with him all along, has been right there beside him doing the work, doing what needs to be done, being in church all the time, being with him, doing all the right things, but he never really understood his heart. He was right there all along the way and he still didn't get his father. He didn't understand. He did not understand him or his heart. I wanna push here and I wanna say this. If you already know Jesus, praise God. I am so thankful that he, has, he found you and he has rescued you and you have a story, but I want to challenge us. But have you stopped thinking about the people that don't know him? Does that burden you? At night or when you're praying, do you have people that you are like, Lord, please show up for them. Please let them see you. Or do you just go on 
about your day. You see, I believe that we need to be a church that is burdened by people that don't know Jesus. This church, this church exists to make disciples that make an impact. And I believe that we have many disciples in this room, people that have said yes to Jesus and are furthering along the faith. But then guess what? Once we do that, we are called to come and bring someone else alongside of them. Who is that person for you? Do you have a name? Does someone come to your mind? Because friends, that's our job. That's what we're here to do is to be able to further his kingdom. Because what will happen is, if we stop thinking about those people, this place will just become a place for us. It'll just become a place for believers where we can come and we can be fed and we can go on about our day. And then it becomes all about us. And then that lie, that lie becomes very true to the world. They go, oh, I can't go there. I would definitely not be welcomed when I walk through those doors. No, friends, this place, this place is for all people, you, me, people out there, to come and call home. My caution to us is we can very easily be like the older son, with the father the whole entire time and still miss it, still miss him. And so our challenge for us today is how can we get to know the heart of the Father even more? The heart of the Father is this. It is filled with love and grace. And grace is something we talk about and grace is something that that younger son received. And we love to talk about how we received it. But I think we fall short when we have to actually give it to people. We joke around at my house in the sense of like, I try and instill what grace is. Grace is merciful kindness that you do not deserve. It's merciful kindness. It could be something as simple as if you don't eat everything on your plate at our house, you don't get dessert. But mommy can give you grace and allow there to be dessert, okay? But when it comes to things that are happening in our life, it's for that person that person that you're like, please don't use examples because you might use my person. It's what does it look like to show merciful kindness to them, to show them grace. Friends, why would anybody step foot into here if they have not seen what grace even remotely looks like out there? They can't even fathom what the love of the Father is because they haven't even seen it out there. That's what we are called to do, to be able to show that to them, to be able to welcome them in to here. But for too many times, we're just, we're fighting kind of in ourselves of like, are we better than them? Are we this? Are we that? You know, I don't, I don't know if I can talk to them. Their sins are this. Or I, you may not even say those things out loud, but they're in your head. And I would tell you this, Jesus was very clear on who we are to welcome and welcoming to him. In Luke, it says this, then his disciples began arguing over which of one of them was the greatest. Y'all, they were struggling. Here they are the closest to Jesus and they're arguing over who's better. Who didn't sin as much last week? Who didn't whatever? Like, they're, who's better, Jesus? But Jesus knows their thoughts. I love that. And he brought a little child to his side, and he said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child on my behalf welcomes me. Y'all, he used the child because at that time, the children were the lowest of the low of the low. And so for us, he's saying, for that person, for the person that maybe has had this sin or this or whatever, whoever you're thinking of, like, anybody but them, Jesus, that person... That's who he's talking about. And he's saying, when you welcome them on my behalf, you're welcoming me and my Father who sent me. Whoever's least among you is to be the greatest. We are to welcome them in. And y'all, I think we do a good job of welcoming them in. We have amazing hospitality. We have y'all, you are amazing. But my thing is, for them to be able to even come onto our campus, they've got to be able to see Jesus in you out there. And you may not even have to speak the name of Jesus, but it's how you respond to them. And I believe it starts with grace. Grace is that merciful kindness. And some of you are like, I don't know what it would look like to give grace to that person, to this person, to whatever, whoever you're thinking of, your friend, your colleague, 
your daughter's, mo- your daughter's friend's mother, like all of that. We have them all around us right now. And you're like, I can't give them grace because of what they did. Friends, you can give grace not because of what someone did, but because of who God is. That is the only way we can show merciful kindness to people you don't really even know or merciful kindness to the people you do know who have hurt you or hurt others. What does this look like? Let's get real. In my life, it looks like showing grace to the drug addict, to that battered woman, to the man that abuses her, to the biological mother, to the biological father, and to the children who have been impacted by all of those listed above. Friends, he's calling you right now into who is it that you need to show grace to because here's why the people that I listed above, they have never truly experienced grace and this insane love by anyone here on this earth. And so just by in these circumstances, in the ones you're like, I can't, it's but God, he can. Showing grace to them, they get a glimpse of God and they go, maybe I could step foot into a church. Maybe I can give this God thing a shot. Maybe, just maybe I can walk in and the church not burn down. Friends, we have an opportunity to give grace to them. Don't look at it as something that you have to do, something that's like a check the box thing. No, we have an opportunity to give it to them or we can pitch a fit. I mean, we have a choice. God does give us choices. There is a right choice, just for those of you in the house that are like me, of there's black and white on some things. The opportunity is to join the party or stay outside. You can still be with Jesus and miss all of it. Friends, that's our caution. That's, our, that's why daily disciplines are important with spending time with him and reading the Bible and all that. And guess what? He gives us people in our lives for this opportunity. And I know you're worried right now. You're like, please, let's not pray for those opportunities. Why? Why not? What if it was just a little bit harder on you, but you're safe and secure up on this hill, remember, friends? What if, what if just by what one act of merciful kindness, it could bring somebody to Jesus? Is it worth it? Yeah, it is. You see, we don't even know if the older son went into the party. I hate that part. We don't even know if he went in at all, or maybe he just stood out there the whole entire time sulking, probably, and he missed all of it. Quest Church, I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you just to to be close to the Father for all of your life, but misunderstanding His heart and who He is. And I believe, friends, He has given you that person, whoever that keeps coming into your mind. I believe that's for a reason. Because He's saying, Sarah, would you show them my heart? Would you show them who I am? Because it might just be, you're finally the like, 59th gazillionth person who has done it and they believe. I'm thankful for the people that did that for me. And now we're called to be that for others. Here's the practical part. I said it already, but if you've already accepted Christ, stop standing in the way of people trying to run to him. Like, don't be like tripping them up going like, no, 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 no. Like, what are you doing different this time? Let me have your whole game plan. How's it gonna look? Are you committed to being at church for all this time? No, like let's cheer them on to Jesus. Cause then once they get there, that's when life change happens. That's when things start happening, but we gotta get them to Jesus. Let's cheer them on along the way. And then we'll let them know there's not gonna be a fire when that happens. Instead, there's gonna be a party. And then Quest, I would tell you this. I need you to join that party and let's celebrate what God is doing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I just, I thank you first and foremost that you rescued me, that I was the one and you came running after me and you sent people my way. And so Father, I just ask forgiveness right now for when there have been times that I have stopped thinking 
about other people. When, I, when I've gotten so wrapped up in all of my own things that I just, I forget that, Lord, there are people out there that do not know you, that are going through the hardest of the heart of life, and they don't even have you to cling to. So God, I pray right now that in this room that you would burden our hearts, Father. You would burden our hearts for the people out there that do not know you. But God, I also pray that you would impress on our hearts right now, Lord. So many of us in this room say, we love you. We want to know your heart. And so Father, I pray for all of us to have that life change, that heart change, because God, ultimately we want to be more like you. So Father, I pray that you would show us Show us how we can be more like you. God, I pray that we would not be in the same place with you when we leave from here. God, that we would be another step closer to looking like you. So so Father, would you just do that? Would you do that in our lives? Would you impress on us the people that are out there? And God, would you move us in such a way that we would help bring about the change that you so desire in us and in others? And God, I just ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, you might be wondering like why there's this piece of paper on your chair. I wanted this to be super practical right now. I want you to think about what is God asking you to do today? It could be one of two things. You could be like, he is really impressing upon my heart that like, I just need to be more like him. Yes, I have been that person that has known Jesus for a while, but I do not understand his heart. My heart has become bitter and resentful and I just need a heart change today. Maybe you need that. Or maybe you've been thinking about a person. You've been thinking about a person and maybe different people that keep coming to your mind that every time I kept talking about it, that person came up, that you were like, I feel like God is telling me whether you're supposed to go and talk with them, maybe it's about Jesus, or maybe you're just supposed to show grace to them because they have been in your life for a while and they need that extra grace. Friends, I want you to take this piece of paper and I want you to fold it in half. And then you're gonna write the same thing on both sides because I want you to tear it because I really want you to take one of these home as a reminder of today. And friends, would you be as bold enough to even maybe write your name on it and say, by, my, by writing my name on it, by putting Sarah down on this paper, I'm saying, God, I want my heart to look more like yours. And then, would you write that other person's name down? That person that, man, you may not even want to. But the person that you know needs that merciful kindness, needs Jesus more than anything, would you write that person's name down on here? And again, I want it on both sides because I want you to take this home because tomorrow when you're spending your time in prayer, I want it to remind you to ask God to help give give you a heart like his, but then also to pray specifically for that person and for opportunities to be able to show them. Grace, this is where it gets practical, friends. This is where it gets real and go, Will you do this? I believe that if, y'all look at all the people in this room. If God laid even just one name on your heart in this room, look at how many people's lives would be impacted. So one of these sides, I want you to take home with you. The other side, I would encourage you, would you bring it up here to the stage? Would you literally lay it at Jesus's feet and say, God, in order to do this, I need you. In order to make this happen, I need you. And as just a symbol of that, you would place it up here. You can also place it at either one of the crosses as well. And we're gonna have people at the crosses that maybe you're like, I don't wanna give this up yet. Because maybe the person that's on there, y'all, they would love to pray for you and over you. This isn't a requirement. You don't have to do this. Nobody's, we just talked about not comparing ourselves, okay? So we're not looking at, why isn't she not doing that? Why is she not? This is something to make it practical and go, man, God, I want this. And I want you to burden my heart for what burdens yours. And so during this time, the band's also gonna lead us in a song, but won't you come and respond today?